Okay, I think we should get started. So, uh, uh, the next session is, uh, is uh, about topology and quantum matter, and accordingly, Ashvin has asked me to give a 10 minute review of kinetic matter physics. Um, <laughs> analogy to Daniel's review of high energy physics earlier. <laughs> yeah, that might be too long. Yeah, well, so I'm going to keep it, I'm going to keep it briefer than that. I hope. Um, and uh, so I guess uh, maybe maybe I should just say that um, the microphone is on. I believe. Let's see. Is it? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, there, there's a green light. Look. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I hear yeah. At least it amplifies the percussion. Um, so, so uh, topology is kind of hard to avoid in thinking about phases of quantum matter. Uh, it's sort of baked into the definition. The definition of a phase of quantum matter being an equivalence class of Hamiltonians, such that uh, you can get from the ground state of one to the ground state of another. Um, without encountering any kind of wall of non-analyticity. That is, if that's the case, then we call them equivalent. And so this introduces some notion of continuity, and uh, immediately the problem of classifying phases of matter becomes a, a topology problem. And uh, uh, rather than, and in any, like in any such topology problem, rather than trying to, when, when trying to distinguish, when trying to ask whether two phases are the same, rather than trying to search every path from one to the other and ask whether we encounter some, whether we can get around the walls of non -analyticity. Um It's better to have some kind of label on, on the phases, something which is invariant under the, under the continuous maps, uh, like so, something like an integer, which can't, which can't, uh, which can't change smoothly. And uh, okay, so in, in the search for such integers, uh, symmetry has historically played an important role. Uh, for example, if we spontaneously break a Z2 symmetry, then the number of ground states in the thermodynamic limit is 2, which is an integer, which is different from 1, which would be the number of ground states in a paramagnetic phase. Um, and uh, I guess already even the definition of what it means for something to be a symmetry is a topological one, namely, uh, uh, for example, namely, uh, it means something like the world lines of particles can't, can't end. And for higher form symmetries, it means that there's some kind of strings or brains that can't, that can't break. Um, so, all, you know, okay, already there, that's, that, uh, that's a very topological notion. I guess I learned this from Ryan. Um, but but uh, for distinguishing paramagnetic phases, it turns out that, that there are a lot of different paramagnetic phases. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very useful notion is, uh, is, is the notion of anomaly. Which I guess I think I, I think will come up in all in all of the talks in this session, and uh, anomaly. I guess we already heard about it from Zohar, um, but it you know it began its life as this very funny uh, uh, high high energy theory notion that of a symmetry that's it's a symmetry of the class it's a classical symmetry but not a quantum symmetry it's a symmetry of the action, but not of the of the, the measure of the path under it, um, and. Uh, uh, but it turned, you know, this seems like kind of a dumb thing, which, which well, okay, anyway. Um, uh, but it, it turns out to be a very deep notion with, with uh, lots, of, lots of amazing consequences. Um, and it turns out that actually the important thing is not so much that the action is invariant, but that the measure is not invariant. That, um, so one thing it gives is, is uh, uh, various kinds of labels we can put on phases. And I guess, so let me just say a few ways to, to think about, about this notion of anomaly different from a symmetry of the action that's not a symmetry of, of the measure. Um, one one is is that it's a it's a RG invariant. I guess this is the the crucial notion that Zohar used that um, whatever anomaly is carried by the microscopic description also has to be somehow represented in, in whatever the long wavelength theory of the of the low energy stuff uh, is. And so this gives some 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 uh, constraints on, on what, what the long, wave, long wavelength physics is. It gives some constraints on what, what possible things can happen given some microscopic description. And uh, um, relatedly, another a related point of view on an anomaly is that it's, a, a, it's an obstruction to certain microscopic realizations of, of, uh, of ways that symmetries act on some certain set of degrees of freedom, such as 
uh, it can't, uh, uh, sometimes it means that you can't have a symmetry that acts uh, uh, as a product of separate unitaries acting on each site uh, one at a time. And another another way to another way to think about it. Oh, and so okay. Accord, accordingly, this this notion of of anomaly is why it allows us to classify symmetry protected topological phases. That is, phases of matter which are <coughs> characterized entirely by what they do if you put them on a space with boundary. Um, uh, the boundary theory is something that has an anomaly, which uh, uh, you, you couldn't couldn't realize intrinsically in that number of dimensions. And then finally. Uh, Another point of view on it is that it's an obstruction to, to, to ways of regulating a field theory. Uh, and I guess this is, this is the point of view uh, that leads to the Nielsen enemy of fermion doubling theorem that, that makes it difficult to realize Carl gauge theories in the lattice. I guess that's another high, high energy point of view. Um, OK, that's my summary of all of condensed matter physics. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and then finally, I guess anomalies have, have lots of other applications that uh, uh, one of which